HTML forms contain a variety of form elements, sometimes referred to as controls. We commonly see text box, check box, radio buttons, drop down list, a text area box, and buttons. Most form elements are created using the input tag and varying the value of the type attribute. HTML forms are designed to accept information from the user. Typically, the user will enter information, click a button, that information is sent to a script on the server and processed somehow. Forms can also be processed with JavaScript in the browser. For example, a calculator would not need to send data to the server, it would display information to the user on the screen. There are two components of HTML forms, the actual form itself and the server-sided processing script. In order to obtain information from the form, it needs to be processed with a script. Typically, the script will send out an email confirmation to the person who filled out the form. It could also write information to a text file, update a database, or perform some other type of processing on the server. So here we see a form that has been filled out. The user clicks the button and the data is sent to the server to be processed. HTML forms are created using the form tag. We have the opening form tag and the closing form tag. The form tag has several HTML attributes. You can uniquely identify it with an ID attribute and the name attribute. However, you may not need to use those attributes. You will need the action attribute, which indicates the script on the server that will process the form, and the method attribute, which indicates how that data will be sent to the server. The encoding type will indicate a specific encoding if needed, and the target attribute is to target the reply from the form into another window. All of the form elements and other HTML content are placed inside the opening and closing form tag. The form tag itself is a block level element. All of the other form elements are inline elements. Therefore, you need to use CSS in order to lay out your form in a visually appealing manner. The text box element is created using the input tag and we set the value of the type attribute to text. This is the default value for the type attribute. If you omit the type attribute, you will get a text box by default. Every form element has two important attributes the name attribute and the ID attribute. The value of the name attribute uniquely identifies this form element to the server. The value of the ID attribute uniquely identifies this form element for JavaScript and for CSS. You will often see the same value being used for both the name attribute and the ID attribute, the size attribute indicates how many characters will be visible in that text box. The default is approximately 15 characters, which will vary according to the browser. This attribute can be replaced with CSS. The max length attribute should always be set. By default, the user can type in an infinite number of characters in a text box. For security purposes, you should limit the length that the user can type based on the amount of data required for that form field. The user will enter a value and that value will be paired with the name attribute and sent to the server for processing. So here we see if the user entered this information, 
Every form element has a unique name attribute. So the name attribute and the value entered by the user would be paired together and sent to the server. You will commonly hear this referred to as name value pairs. Radio and checkboxes will only return a value if they are checked. If they are not checked, nothing will be sent to the server. Text boxes will send a value of nothing or emptiness to the server, even if the user does not enter data in them. The password box is created using the input tag, and we vary the value of the type attribute and set it to password. A password box is the same as a text box, except that you cannot see what the user is typing in it, as those characters are masked by the browser. It has the same attributes. Again, you always need a name attribute to uniquely identify that form element for the server, and that is paired with the ID attribute, which is used with JavaScript and CSS. JavaScript is commonly used to validate the form before it is sent to the server. Again, you always want to set the max length property to limit the number of characters that the user can enter for security reasons. A hidden field. A hidden field is coded with the input tag and the type attribute is set to the value of hidden. This is not visible on the page so therefore, you only need a name and an ID attribute. However, it is used to send some type of data to the server, so you will need to code in a value. Radio buttons, or a radio box, are coded with the input tag. The type attribute is set to radio. Because the user takes the cursor and clicks into the radio button on the page, as opposed to entering text, we need to code in a value. The value attribute indicates what radio button was checked. The radio button has a name and an ID attribute also. Radio buttons are mutually exclusive, meaning in a group of radio buttons, only one radio button can be checked. Therefore, the value of the name attribute must be the same for all of the radio buttons in a group. This is the only time when the value of the name attribute is not unique. However, the IDs will always be unique, and you need to set a value to identify which button was checked. You can check a radio button by default, by merely adding the checked attribute inside the input element. Checkboxes are very similar to radio buttons. They are coded using the input tag. The value of the type attribute is checkbox. They will have a name and an ID attribute, and because the user is just clicking on that box in the browser, we need to code in the value attribute to indicate what choice they have made. There are two ways to code groups of checkboxes. They can share the same name, and if they do, you need to make sure that the server-sided script is able to retrieve them all using that same name. The more common way of coding a group of checkboxes is to give them all different names. Checkboxes can be checked by default by entering the checked attribute inside the input tag. If a checkbox does not have a value and it is checked, it will return on as the value. The drop-down list is coded using the select element, so we will have an opening and closing select tag. The choices will be coded in using an opening and closing option tag. Because the user can only make one selection in a typical drop-down list, the name and the ID attributes belong in the select element. The values belong in the option element, 
as they are the different choices that the user can select. By default, the first choice is always selected. It is possible to create a drop-down list without the value attribute. In this case, the text inside the opening and closing <coughs> option tags will be the value. However, it is more professional to code in a value attribute. Should you wish to select a value by default, you can use the selected attribute inside the option element. A drop-down list can be configured to allow multiple selections. That is accomplished by using the multiple attribute inside the select tag. You also can indicate the number of choices to be visible in a multiple drop-down list by using the size attribute. A larger text area that allows you to scroll is created using the opening and closing text area tags. This element needs a name attribute and an ID attribute, as all of the HTML form elements do. The size of the text area can be configured by using the calls attribute and the rows attribute. However, it also can be configured using CSS width and height. The label element is used for accessibility. Every form element should have a label element associated with it. There are two ways of using the label element. You can place the opening and closing label tags around the text description and the form element, or you can place the label tag on top of the form element, enclosing the description, and use the for attribute to associate the ID value of that form element. The field set and legend elements are also used for accessibility. They logically group and relate form content. So here we have an opening and closing field set element, which places a box around it, and the legend. These are block level elements. Finally, we have buttons. Buttons can be created using either the input element or the button element. When we use the input element with the type equals submit attribute, that automatically configures a submit button that will send the form data to the server. By default, it will say submit. Should you wish it to say something else, you can code in a value attribute. The input type equals reset button will automatically reset the form elements to the initial value. By default, it will say reset. Should you wish to code in your own value, you can using the value attribute. We also have a custom input value using input type equals button. This is purely used with JavaScript. The button element has a type attribute also. If we set the type to button, it will be a generic button. If we set the type to submit, it will submit the form. If we set the type to reset, it will reset the form to the initial values. The content in between the opening and closing button is what that button will say, and you can put HTML and images in between this opening and closing button tags.